Dr. Ryan Stan here, ASEP Frontline. Once again, ASEP 16 in uh, beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. Shockingly, it's uh, rather warm and uh, clear outside. So, uh, you know, I think that's probably the uh, 8,000th day in a row or something like that for uh, Las Vegas. We're having a good time here talking about some of the leaders in emergency medicine. And today for this episode, we're joined by Mary Jo Wagner, Chief Academic Officer, CMU Medical Education Partners and Professor, Central Michigan University College of Medicine. And our topic here today is going to be Pier 9. When I was coming through, I was studying hard, had the full books of Pier 7, studying in the floors of an apartment in Charleston, South Carolina, um, as I'm uh, studying for uh, uh, studying for boards and such. And so now we're up to, uh, up to Pier 9. So give us a little idea. How did you get involved? And um, um, kind of give us the background for those that haven't had any experience with, uh, with the Peer Series, what it's all about. Well, interestingly, the Peer Series actually started in 1974. Um, ASEP was asked to develop something that would show that emergency medicine was its own unique specialty mm-hmm. and that there could be a test on it that would be different than medicine or surgery or those sort of things. So that was actually, if you think about it, the beta test for the ABAM. When we finally became a board-certified specialty, then the ABMS or ABAM took over doing the boards, and then PEER continued as the Just Like the Boards Study Questions series. So there's been PEER, and then two through, and now we're up to nine. I started helping as the um, editor in PEER 6, and I've been doing them ever since. So you were responsible for that one. I I laid through for hours and hours on end until the books (laughs) held little shape similar to the books of which I bought. So give us an idea. What are the platforms we're using now when people are looking at the peer series with peer nine? What are the options, um, study options? Because now as the generations with the millennials coming through, um, we have folks that like to study in different ways in terms of physical hands-on books, um, electronic versions. What, how, what can we expect from uh, peer nine in terms of accessibility and how folks can get a, get, get a look at it? So right now, it is on, um, online purely. We actually, for those of us who are my generation and possibly yours, are going to publish a textbook around January. Um, but right now, we have it so it's exactly like the boards, which are all electronic, mm-hmm. um, and the format is online. They're, they also are compatible with all of the various um, mobile apps and those sort of things as well. So you'll have essentially any format that you're used to studying that you'll be able to use peer with. So it's a, uh, that is nice. That means it's very portable, which is good for us in emergency medicine. We are trying to carve out that time. I'm coming up on my, um, I'm coming up on my research here in a, in a year or two. And so uh, I will definitely be pouring into peer nine here, not too terribly long. Give us an idea of how it's laid out. When I was going through, you had the questions, you had these very lengthy and detailed descriptions. How is the layout and and what is the reasoning for that type of layout in terms of getting us prepared for the boards? So now we've online, we've had it a little bit more distinct. Um, You first take a pretest if you're going to do the CME, so that Mm -hmm. gives you a little bit of a sense of where your um, strengths and weaknesses are. Then you can format the um, process in whatever way you want. You can build your own tests, you can make it a real test, or you can make it what we call sort of a practice environment where you'll get the answers right away. Um, When it comes up, it has the classic peer question just like the boards have. And then the correct answer has a large paragraph that's a description of why it's correct. What we're well known for is, of course, why the other answers weren't correct. Mm -hmm. And there are bulleted sections so that you can see why they aren't correct. And they're written by people who make the same mistakes that you and I make when we look at the test. So we know why you fell into that trap or what you were thinking about. And so we write our incorrect answers and the explanations for those. And that's what provides a lot of the education. Since um, Pure 8, some of our new aspects are something now called Pure Point, which then may have 
um, a mnemonic or a series of items that you have to remember. Um, for instance, they might have the five things that you want to think about for um, some compartment syndrome, for instance, or something like that. Then there's also peer review um, that will bullet the, the things that we think people most often forget about that topic area, and you can highlight that and go back and look at that like the day before your boards to remember all those things that you think you might have forgotten. Um, and we have a where to find other information, so that will link to articles online, to any kind of foam um, education and to, for instance, um, other interesting diagrams mm -hmm. or things like that. The big thing, I think, as would be a customer, uh, you know, somebody that's going to be using this product and have in the past, how do we, or how do you guys ensure that the product, which is the peer series, peer nine, is reflective of the board exam that we are going to see when we step into that testing center? Well, a couple different things. Um, we spend a lot of time actually with the information that ABAM provides about how they are testing us and what kind of information um, that they are testing us on, the model of emergency medicine, and we directly replicate that. We also have very um, close relationship with the, any of the public information that they provide in terms of what's changing. For mm -hmm. instance, if you haven't taken a boards exam for a while, you'll be surprised to start seeing moving images of ultrasounds in the next year or two from ABAM, and we will continue to do the same thing in that manner. Um, we always use the standard references for emergency medicine as the basis of our question. So you will see one of the top five or six textbooks for emergency medicine as our basis, along with then, if it's at all controversial of a question, multiple other articles to help support the answers, which is similar to the way it's done by ABEM. So you're, not, you're saying that we're not having uh, testers go in, write things on their hand, and then come back <laughs> out and... Well, that's an awfully similar question you've got there on the uh, Pier 9 series. That would be nice. It would be nice, but it's not at all what happens. But interestingly, when you start writing these tests and have done it as long as I am, you start noticing things in medicine that come in threes or fours, which is the number of of potential answers for something. Mm -hmm. So if I know there's three of something and then a, a wrong fourth, sometimes that makes a fantastic question. And so I'm sure the ABEM writers do the same thing when they think about medicine as they go through life. So it's not surprising that we're testing the same information. The medicine is the same that we're testing. Well, that's really interesting. And I, and I, I think it's a great resource. We have, uh, you know, when we're getting ready for our tests and that sort of thing, it, you always talk about which methods you use, whether it's a, a study book, a summary book, whether you go back to those larger books that are good for standing on to boost up or for <laughs> holding doors open. Where do questions fall and why is the question format an important tool for preparing for that test and for, that, uh, for, the, for the boards and then for recertification? Well, I've spent a lot of time as a program director trying to see how people learn and what works best for studying for tests. Mm -hmm. And there's probably a hundred years of data that shows that taking practice tests is one of the single best ways to study. Now, a lot of people think that means looking at questions, which is not exactly it. Looking at questions means you're sort of skimming, yeah, I probably would have got that one right and moving on. But actually taking practice tests. so putting yourself in a quiet room, answering them without immediately looking at the answers, um, and seeing where you got things right or wrong is one of the best ways to study for an exam. And that's one of the things that PEER can do for you very nicely. Um, some other things that, that really help you um, pass an exam is spaced learning, which means not doing it the last night before the exam, right. but um, using it over six months or one year or realistically two months, which is what most emergency physicians end up doing, um, and repeating things at about a 10 to 20 percent ratio between the time of you, when you start studying and when you finish, so you know where you're weak that you've repeated it enough times to make a difference. Well, yeah, I think most emergency doctors have that, uh, oh, crap, my test is in two months, and so we need to... I mean, you have, we, we, we are all creatures of good intention, and we all think we're going to do a great job studying for a year or two years or whatnot, but it is. It's one of those, like, oh, crap, my board's coming up in two months or, or whatever, and then you start trying to, to cram it in, and then I'm always jealous of those folks that can get down there two nights before and knock a bunch of stuff out and walk in like a breeze. It's... You know, a medical school friend who what didn't study or go to the lab one night, crammed in the hallway before the test, <laughs> as soon as the test started, and breezed right through it, everything. I am not one of those people. I do not have that ability to, uh, 
absorb that long-term memory on a, on a quick. It takes a lot of that, uh, a lot of repetition. How large of a question bank are we talking here? How many questions are we dealing with? So today there are 300 brand new ones. That's excluding the 450 from Pier 8 and the 400 from Pier 7. And so over the span of the next year or so, we will bring some of those back for people um, to take. And then we're intending on having eventually 1,200 questions um, with that and all of the new ones. Starting in January, something that's different is Peer won't just come out every five years. They'll, you know, we will be updating it every month with new questions. So more turning it into like the active app model or exactly. a program model where we're constantly updating it and, and, and keeping it a little bit fresh Correct. Um, every single time. Where, where are we finding the, uh, the Peer 9? I know you guys are here at ASEP 16, uh, but uh, for the folks when this is released down the road and the, the this hallway is uh, clear. Is filled with some other conference. Where where are we going to find this uh, down the road? So it, um, on the ASAP um, website, you can go right now. It's on the front page of the ASAP website, and at the ASAP bookstore, it will always be there for you to do and to sign up for. All right. So uh, uh, w when you think about it, you're a program director. All right. We assume you have a um, end up doing uh, working a lot with students, residents things like that, or, you know, throughout your career. When you see a good study program, I mean, we're getting a little bit off of the Pier 9 here, but uh, kind of similar mindset. When you're talking about the studying, when you're talking about that preparation, whether it's initially for the boards or whether it's for that recertification, that uh, a 10-year recertification, what would be your recommendations in terms of getting prepared and making sure that you're ready to knock it out when you walk into that testing center? So one of the best things to do and why most people do actually pass the exam, even though we all cram at the end, mm -hmm. um, is because we learn from our patients and we learn every single day. And so just taking the time to connect the patients that you saw that day and answering the questions you had about their care, whether that's in the ED, which is made so much easier now with all of the information online, or whether it's at home after you've seen that patient that night, the next morning, um, and looking up the th questions you still have is still the very best way to study. The more you can connect them to your patients, the mm -hmm. more you'll actually remember things. Because we always remember that patient that you think of. If I say CHF, you immediately have a picture of a patient in your brain. And so if you connect all the information about that disease to that picture, you'll retain that information much longer. So one of the reasons why then looking at questions in a batch, for instance, if you had an interesting patient and then you can go and find a question like that, you can then tie your board's knowledge to your real knowledge. And then it's not really studying. Then it's information. And then it's just learning what you need for your job. What about the, the, the physician that's practicing in, say, a community or rural doc where you don't see all of the stuff? You don't see a whole lot of trauma you don't see a lot of critical care strokes, heart attacks, or vice versa. That person that's always in the trauma center, so you don't see things from the community standpoint. How do we pull back in the knowledge? Because you're not, when you go into the testing center to take your test, you're not being tested based on where you practice. You're being tested on the breadth of emergency medicine. How, how do you pull back? That's, that seems like it's a potential pitfall for the physicians out there if you practice in one type of place during that 10 years that may exclude some of those other diagnoses. Well, one of the things that is really important for you to continue to become competent and really develop expertise in emergency medicine is to always think about the patient in front of you and then what ifs. So for instance, with my residents, I will say, well, this patient has sore, a sore throat and so it's likely strep, but what if I told you that patient was HIV positive? Mm -hmm. What does that do to your differential? And so as a physician anywhere, you can do that to yourself and you can look at that information. You'll still remember the patient standing in front of you with a right. sore throat, right. and yet you can add so much information to that by creating that. And that's actually how we then create questions um, also. So that's why questions are so nice because, again, if we can tie it to a patient you've seen um, and maybe information you don't know, then that will help you learn it and really make sure you retain it. Because our, really our goal is to make sure that you have this information for your clinical practice. Physicians do that all. I mean, they, that's, I think, one of the challenges is we, when we go into a room now, especially if you have a lot of experience, you've, you've got a decade of emergency medicine under your belt, 
you very you very quickly target down to the likely diagnosis because of the throughput that uh, that's being really pressed on us more than anything. And so maybe even sitting back and, and trying to expand on that differential. That's what's nice working with students, uh, students, residents, you know, PA students, nurse practitioner students, is they really make you think about that broad differential more often because they'll ask you the questions and keep you on your toes and say, what, what if or what not? Or, or uh, this is what I think it is. And you say, well, think about that, but then what else could be going on here? Thinking in that broad broad differential. Give us uh, a way to, uh, you mentioned the ASAP website, asap.org in the bookstore. Uh, if people have any questions about that, is there a way, uh, whether email, social media, to contact you and uh, for, any, for any questions? Sure. I mean, they can always contact um, our editor through ASAP, um, and they can certainly contact me um, through my email, um, which is on the ASAP website as well for the members. Um, that's MJ Wagner, W-A-G-N-E-R, at Chris, C-R-I-S dot com. Absolutely wonderful. I appreciate your time. And I'll be, uh, I guess I'll be digging into Pier 9 here very soon as I try to get ready for my um, research here in, uh, in the next year or so. As for me, you can get in touch with us via the uh, ASAP Frontline Facebook page. Look up ASAP Frontline. Also, contact me on, uh, on social media, on Twitter, at EverydayMed, or via email, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com. Make sure that you spread the word, that you get folks on board via iTunes to subscribe to the ASAP Frontline Podcast. We're going to be bringing you 52 a year at least, at least once a week. Probably going to have some bonus stuff in there every once in a while. Um, so, you know, let's, let's get on there, help educate, make sure that we are the most up to date when it comes to emergency medicine. I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton. I hope you'll join me next time for ASAP Frontline.